Uh, I'm going to talk about financial crises. 2007-2008 uh, reminds me of uh, Faulkner's words that the past is not only not dead, it's not past. Uh, so what is a financial crisis? Well, a financial crisis is an event in which households and firms or firms uh, no longer believe that debt, the private money of banks, is worth par. And instead, to be safe, they want their cash. So it's a bank run. And banks do not have the cash. And so by this definition, they're insolvent. And just to be clear, we're talking about the system being insolvent. Right? So uh, as Bernanke said shortly after Lehman, of the 13 largest financial institutions in the United States, 12 are on the verge of bankruptcy. So it's important that we keep in mind that it's systemic. It's not any old bad thing. It's systemic. And what do we know about these things? We know that financial crises occur in all market economies, in advanced economies and emerging markets, in economies with and without central banks, in economies with and without deposit insurance. But economies can go quite a while without a, uh, without a crisis. Uh, they come on rather suddenly. They always involve private short-term debt. They're typically preceded by credit booms, but not all credit booms are bad. They occur near business cycle peaks. Uh, they're systemic, as I said. And then you have these prolonged uh, recoveries, and they're extremely, extremely costly. They look like this. Now, that's the panic of 1907. And you may say, well, I didn't see that in 2007, 2008. What do you mean there was a bank run? And the answer is, well, you weren't on a trading floor, so you didn't see it. And if you're like my colleagues on the trading floor, the AIG Financial Products, they saw it, they didn't know what it was. So as Einstein said, theory determines what you see. And uh, that was indeed the case. But for, the, for outsiders, uh, they indeed didn't see uh, the bank run, which is one of the most insidious things about the crisis. Because then if you only know about one crisis, you can draw a lot of lines through one crisis. Those are those narratives that Andy Lowe had up here. As soon as you have to talk about more than one crisis, um, then we have a problem. There's another problem. And the, other prob the next problem is that when a central bank is present or a, an act of government, you don't always see runs. Uh, indeed, the agents wait to see what the government's going to do. Uh, and the, if there are runs, the runs tend to come late compared to what I think of as pure crises as 2007, 2008, or the whole prior history of the US uh, from 1914 back to the 18th century. So the World Bank uh, data set, uh, there's about 150 systemic crises, uh, which follow uh, a practical uh, way of implementing uh, my definition. Uh, and these 65% uh, involve bank runs. So the issue, the issue at hand is, what, what exactly is the mechanism, the mechanism of short-term debt, which can lead to the financial system being insolvent? Okay. So um, let me go to that. So banks, uh, banks produce debt. That's their product. Ford produces cars. McKinsey produces advice. Banks produce uh, debt, short-term debt. And yet this debt is vulnerable to uh, runs. So it's a little paradoxical that throughout history, from the 18th century, we would observe short-term debt in various forms. And yet it all has the same problem. Uh, and yet, in some sense, it's optimal. So why, how, how can that be? Well, what I'm going to try to convince you of is that there's a property of debt, which I'll define in a moment, called information insensitivity, which says that we're going to try to create something such that it's not profitable for any agent to produce private information about the underlying collateral. Uh, and everybody knows this. And what that means is that we do not want the price system to work. So, so we're going to try to construct debt such that the price system doesn't work. I'm going to give you the intuition for that in a minute. But you know, no economists are used to thinking about price systems. The only other place where the price system is not used is inside firms, huge economies inside firms. But here's something that's going to be in the market, but we're going to try to make it so the price system doesn't work, and that's going to be optimal. So let me give you an example of that. Let's start with an example that didn't work. This is a free bank note from Bullshead Bank. 
uh, pre-Civil War U.S. It's very worn, which means it's probably genuine because it's been passing around for quite a while. And, and here's, here's one of the issues with these kind of things. This is the haircut or discount on notes from the Bank of Tennessee in Philadelphia. Okay? So this thing's moving all over the place. What does that mean? That means if I came from New Haven to New York with a private bank note and I tried to buy lunch, they might say to me, they'd look up in this little newspaper and they'd say, wait a minute, that's not worth $10 here. That's worth $9. And I'd say, what are you talking about? I was here last week. It was worth nine fifty, And there would be a big, a big problem. Contemporaries talked about this over and over again. Now, this market, this market is efficient in the FAMA sense. Right? If you, this is a, a non-interest-bearing perpetual bond uh, with an embedded put option that says you can take it back to the bank and ask for par. And what's the maturity of this note? The time it takes to get from Philadelphia to the Bank of Tennessee. And if you use that and you back out the implied volatilities and you look at that in panel data, you'll see those line up with all the risk characteristics of different states that we would expect. So it's, it's efficient in the pharma sense, but it's not economically efficient. It doesn't, it, it doesn't help to uh, uh, facilitate transactions. And this was noticed a long time ago. This is Ricardo. In the use of money, everybody is a trader. Those who are little suited to explore the mechanism of trade are obliged to make use of money, bank, bank money and are not in no way qualified to assert the solidity of different banks whose paper is in circulation. Accordingly, we find that laborers, mechanics, and so on suffer these severe losses. So this idea that, that we don't want this price moving around is something which is uh, of long standing. So what I want to do is to talk about this mechanism. And to do that, I want to give you the intuition for some work with Tree V. Dang and Bengt Holmstrom. I don't think Tree V is here. I haven't seen him. Bengt is here somewhere, or he was here. So uh, I'm just going to walk through some figures. It'll give you the intuition. It's not exactly right, uh, but it'll give you the intuition. So the idea here is uh, that when you look at this bank contract, that's the hockey stick looking thing, uh, and on the bottom there's collateral. Uh, the flat part's the face value. Um, in a moment, we're going to look at before maturity. But the idea is if the collateral value is far to the right, then there's no point in you figuring out that that it's far to the right. You're not, going to, you're not going to produce information and learn that it's far to the right. Now, of course, you have to have some reason to believe that it's far to the right, and we'll, we'll come to that. Suppose before uh, maturity, the collateral is distributed this way, normal, uh, and you can see the mean there. That's the, the x-axis is the same as before. The y-axis is now the likelihood of each of those collaterals being what's going to happen at maturity. So it's most likely, most likely to mean. So now let me put those two pictures together. So here's, here's what I overlay that normal distribution on the debt contract. The x-axis is the same. It's the collateral. And the y-axis now has two scales. It's the price at the end, or the final value, or uh, the likelihood of these different collateral values. Now the point of doing this is to point out that if you wanted to spend money to determine you know, how to think about this debt, uh, what you're going to find is the integral of that little blue triangle. Right? And the point is, that's very small. It's very small. And so it may not pay you uh, to do that. And that's going to be important, because what, what, a, what a crisis is going to be is this. Think of this distribution as the entire economy. If it moves a little bit to the left, that triangle now becomes larger, and it becomes red. And if that's common knowledge, then suddenly I'm worried that you're going to produce information, or you have already, or you're worried that I'm going to produce information, and nobody knows what's going on, and so we all better go get our cash. So we just need, we need the macroeconomy to weaken a little bit. That's the, that's the distribution shifting to the left. And that triangle, if that triggers information production or fears of information production, we're going to say it went from information insensitive to sensitive. Okay? And think of that, all the short-term debt, or at least one kind of short-term debt, that's going to happen to in the economy. So just, just to make this clear, here's equity. Equity is the green line. Uh, equity, when, when, the, when the collateral value is to the right of the kink, the firm is solvent. And this stuff is, this stuff is uh, always information sensitive, right? Because if you go from the collateral up to the green line and over to the price of the equity, when it's, when it's rising like that, 
it's always going to be it's always going to be sensitive. That's why you see equity traded all in one exchange in a central place, whereas other things are traded over the counter, uh, and we don't much care about the price. So, so the point here is that when you cut the information, uh, cut the cut the cash flows, you cut the information, and that that's that's the key here. Now, here's here's the loss distribution on debt. Okay, so most of the time. Uh, debt has no loss. You could lose everything. There's a maximum you can lose. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to reflect this around like this, like that. And I'm going to put that together with the debt contract picture like that. So you see the reflected distribution, the loss distribution of a, of a debt. Now is the, it's now the collateral for the short-term debt, which was the original green line. And the point is that that little triangle We've now made that triangle really, really small, right? And the, the, intu the intuition is kind of straightforward. If I, if I have long-term debt that we think is pretty close to information insensitive, and I use that to back the short-term debt, then I, by, do, by using debt on debt, I can maximize the information insensitivity. And if I do that, then I'll have, uh, then I'll have something that we can use as money uh, whether it's repo or fee rank notes or demand deposits or bills of exchange. But uh, it, again, it has this vulnerability being privately produced that if we have the whole economy shift a little bit to the left, which would be this distribution making the triangle bigger, then you, then you have this mechanism where everybody runs on all of that debt, all of that debt. That's the kind of mechanism you need for a crisis, right? Because a crisis is we go over the cliff, right? It's not, it's not uh, the case that it's, you know, you know, there's something about, I don't know, leverage or subprime or ratings or whatever you want. That doesn't tell us the mechanism. It doesn't say those are unimportant, but it doesn't tell us the mechanism. Now, this has a lot of implications. Uh, one of the implications is that banks are going to be surrounded by secrecy because they don't want people producing information about their backing collateral. In fact, in this world, uh, the optimal thing would be for the government to pass a law that says anybody who produces information about short-term debt gets shot. Right? We don't want people producing information. Um, and so banks go to great lengths to preserve this opacity, and that's why they have certain kinds of you know, consumer mortgages, small business loans, uh, and so on. Now, uh, so, so, so what happened that we got ourselves into trouble uh, in 2007, 2008. So look at this picture. Let me tell you what this picture is. This picture is the components of privately produced safe debt divided by total privately produced safe debt. It's Fed flow funds data. It's from this little paper with Metric and Llewellyn. So let me just say it again. It's the components of privately produced safe debt divided by total privately produced safe debt. Now, you can see that in 1952, the bulk of this was demand deposits. And the government had made demand deposits information insensitive by making, having deposit insurance, which, by the way, was passed over the objections of economists who were babbling on about moral hazard back then. Um, but you can see what happens to demand deposits. As a fraction of total privately produced safe debt, it goes straight down pretty much. Right? And it flattens out at the end. And what's the next category up? Well, the next category above debt is money market instruments. So that's repo, commercial paper, money market, uh, money market funds, especially institutional money market funds. So what's happening, and there's a lot of things happening in the background. Um, uh, part of it is that there, there's this massive pools of cash in the hands of institutional investors because of all the wealth that's been created in the last 30 or 40 years uh, is, is one, one thing. So you need a sort of checking account for institutions, right? So that next category up is their checking account. So most commercial paper is one to three days. Uh, repos, you know, overnight or short. Uh, money market funds, it's on demand. And so what, what's going to back all that stuff? Well, the answer is the next category. So the next category is triple A securitizations. Triple A securitizations. And how do we get, make AAA securitizations? Well, the fact that demand deposits are going down doesn't mean the banks are making fewer loans. It means we're taking the loans that they make and we're putting them into bonds 
And those bonds are going to back the money market instruments. So let me say a couple words about that. One, one thing is that these two systems are symbiotic. You, can, you, know, you kill one, you kill the other. The other thing I would point out is that shadow banking didn't develop in like 2003. If you look at this picture, this metamorphosis of the entire financial system has been going on for quite a while, right? At least since the mid-70s. And so you say, well, this is flow of funds data. How come the Fed didn't see this? And the answer is, you know, from Einstein, theory determines what you see. Theory determines what you see. So if you have no concept of safe debt, it's never going to occur to you to make this picture, right? So, so this, this transformation is uh, longstanding, large, and permanent. OK, so history, history suggests that financial crises are inevitable because the system is constantly transforming with new forms of debt. But that happens over a longer period than the attention span of financial economists, apparently. Um, so this panic showed that the system can morph, but it's only this long, over this long uh, period of time. So there's tons of research questions here that we really need to work on. One, one, I think, is why didn't we have a crisis from 34 to 2007? If you consider somebody's narrative, you know, you say, okay, that story sounds good. Why didn't we have a crisis from 1934 to 2007? That was an exceptional period in U.S. history. The rest of U.S. history, we had crises every eight or ten years. The next question is also important. What forms of bank regulation work, and what's the optimal regulation? This is not something that we study. And the reason we don't study it is because you, you need to look into the institutional and regulatory arrangements of at least two countries to figure out what countries have in common when they can go for 50 years or so without a crisis. So we don't, we don't really work on that. And finally, there's a question, which is, is there a trade-off between financial repression and economic growth? Right? We, can, we can get rid of financial crises. It'd be like Somalia. They don't have financial crises. And so, you know, so I was recently in India for a week at the central bank. 70% of their banking system is owned by the, by the state, right? So they don't have, they have financial crises. Lately, they've had shadow banking runs. But in general, they don't have financial crises. Then the question is, well, when you have a million people entering the labor market every month, you know, you need to have at least like 6% growth per quarter. So there, this question is really stark. Thank you very much.